So for TI9, we had a pretty good grand finals. It was a fairly dominant show by OG, and in today's video, we're going to be going over the back three games, the three games OG won, and looking at a different player's perspective for each game. And if you enjoy this video, I recommend over on the Game Leap website, you check out the rest of the videos. Exactly what I'm going to be doing here, I'm going to be making four more for the website. I'm going to be doing three different players' perspectives, including the first game where OG actually lost, and talk about why they lost. So for game two, we're going to be looking at Topson's Monkey King. He had a pretty standout performance this game. I felt like he dominated a mid-match matchup that is, I think, Monkey King favored, which is Monkey King versus TA, but I'm on the fence about it, right? Because Monkey King is a zero armor hero, so you'd expect that maybe TA could do quite a bit of damage to him in the mid lane, but his mechanics on this hero is beyond good, and let's talk about how he actually wins this probably not so easy matchup. So the first thing I want to point out is his early priority on Jingu, but how he actually abuses Jingu, because what he does is not commit for four stacks very often, but he actually commits for two or three, and Hopefully you'll get to see what I mean by this. So right away he gets an auto attack in, and then you see he immediately puts a very heavy priority on de -aggering. He's trying to right click this creep, uh, as you can see by his cursor, and that's uh, to take as little damage as possible, because tanking creeps as Monkey King is really bad due to the fact that you start with extremely low armor. And you notice now, he's very much abusing the movements of the TA, so what I want to show is he gets his first hit in, right? Proceeds to get the second one based on this TA kind of making this forward motion, right? Just predicated on her walking forward and throwing an auto attack. He gets a second. And then he kind of knows that the TA doesn't want to move too far away in case he starts denying these creeps, right? And on that notion, he actually walks onto the high ground and gets the third hit in. But what doesn't he do? Immediately go for the fourth. He does not commit for it. That is extremely important. Gets denied, not so good. But now... Because the TA has to get these last hits, he's able to get the Jingu. Really good side blades from Weeha to get all three CS, but that's how he gets this early Jingu. And then you notice he uses the majority of them, I believe three, to secure creeps. And it's really this slow buildup of Jingu that I think allows him to play the lane a lot different from the majority of Monkey Kings that I see, which for a lot of them is a very heavy committal for Jingu, right? Once they get two stacks, they're basically diving. And I don't think that is the right approach, especially for these early levels. Now this next movement here is one that I find very important, so he currently has 3 stacks on Weehan, he doesn't end up getting the 4th, which is interesting, right, because it looks like he potentially has a gap for it here, but he doesn't even play like it's that necessary, in fact, I think he wanted to get the range creep uh, deny, but Weehan makes an incredible uh, last hit play with the side blades, and now you notice... Because Weeha might start hitting this, this melee creep, or even potentially start walking up for this deny coming up here, he walks onto the high ground, right? He's like, okay, if you want to go for the deny, I'm at least going to get one hit in, which is pretty solid. Uh, and then even uses his body to kind of zone out for this deny. So it's really about poking and prodding for these Jingus. And I think that's the main secret here. The next thing Weeha does incredibly well as we slowly examine this very important clip is his ability to kind of like play around tower range near perfectly. So he gets a hit in here, but never manages to walk in tower range. And due to the fact that he's drawing aggro, this range creep took a long time to die, right? Because if you naturally are getting attacked by the creeps, they aren't attacking your creeps, right? And as a result, he gets two hits of Jingyu in and actually a third one right there, which now puts him in a position to go a bit aggressive on Weeha and actually allows him to get Jingyu Mastery. And now what he does with this Jingu is very important. He gets two denies with it, right? It is not a priority necessarily on harassing. It is a priority on using Jingu mastery for creeps, especially in these early levels. So I want to talk about this idea of Monkey King because every single time, without exception, without exception, Monkey Kings always stun when they have three Jingu, especially when trying to turn fights. Now he ends up dying in this clip, but you notice when he's approaching this this potential turn, right, it's close, or it goes for the fourth Jingu before stunning, I very often see Monkey Kings, every time, getting three Jingu and then stunning for the fourth, for whatever reason, even if they don't need to. The thing is, your balance does more damage and gives you significantly more lifesteal if you wait for the fourth hit, and this might sound simple to anyone who, you know, hasn't played Monkey, and I, I don't get why that's a tendency for a lot of these Monkey players, but... It is. So if you see it in your game or notice that habit or for whatever reason, don't panic and really try to get the fourth one. In terms of item build, I'll just briefly mention it. He goes for two Wraith Bands right away, and this basically allows you to get your Jingu very quickly as your attack speed kind of skyrockets with these items. Attack speed actually can be sort of a substitute for an Orb of Venom because you can attack move more effectively with high attack speed. So interesting idea there to, to consider, and I think that's sort of how he looks at it. 
And now you notice, just through diligent last hitting and using Jingu for creeps, he's able to build this fairly substantial advantage uh, in creeps, right? Seven last hits and a very shocking 14 to 3 denies, like very crazy. And, and that's something you typically don't see, right, against TA. Not necessarily that she can get denies anymore after that was patched out, but in the aspect where TA actually is getting denied a lot due to the fact she has high damage. So basically to sum up this laning stage before we move on to the mid game, it's very important not to just run through creep waves, otherwise you're going to take a lot of the damage. Try to poke and prod for Jingu, have no problem with sneaking in one or two Jingu and then backing off, but it's very important to look for those one or two Jingu early on, especially if you can read someone going for a last hit or not. In terms of skill build, I think it's important to consider this. He puts three points in Jingu. I think the main one you definitely want is a minimum of two, but then he starts putting more points in his tree dance, right? He actually has three points in it now and has skipped his ulti. And this allows you to farm, right? Your, your other spells aren't so great at farming. And as a result, if you completely commit to Boundless and, and Jingu, which he occasionally does, if he's very confident he can stop the game, then you lack a lot of farming capabilities. So just be careful. If it's not a god tier Monkey King game, then you really do want to put points into Tree Dance. Now, upcoming here, he actually finds a DD and just runs a Miracle. And I really like this play. If you're ever a Monkey King and you find yourself against like a Jug or, or a Life Stealer or one of those heroes, you definitely can pressure out of lane it's good to make those quick rotations to kind of force them out because a hero like lifesteal in particular very much needs lane creeps otherwise his farm kind of stagnates to some extent so he pressures the lifestealer out of lane then proceeds to cut the lane which i've seen is a big trend with a lot of cores now and then after cutting the lane now tower pressure is on the bottom tower right if i pause tower pressure not too much but you know it, it's there and then he rotates over to a fight right he kind of connects with his team Sets up with the ultimate and then follows it up with a stun, which is very important. And this is kind of the, the strength of OG as a team. They're unbelievably good at getting in lanes and immediately connecting, right? They're so fast at this. And I think it's why they do so well with a hero like Monkey King when other teams could struggle. Even though, you know, actually Monkey King did have good, good stats on the main stage. Not a lot of games, but in general... They are so good at disconnecting. All of a sudden, if we go back 30 seconds, right? They're, they're at the tier threes all of a sudden, even though they haven't taken a single tier one, right? Not a single tier one. But if we look at when Topson was actually at the tier one, the general setup, the tiny is, is in between mid and, in mid and bottom. The monkey king is bottom and there's two heroes mid. And very quickly, even with the connecting of Topson, they collapse, right? Very quick collapse. What are they supposed to do? These two heroes get trapped. They're trapped. They know Miracle has no TP because he just forced it out of him, which, right, is another good reason to pressure out the carry. And all of a sudden, they're diving you, right? And GH is like, I gotta help. And this will happen in your pubs as well. People are like, I gotta help. They're diving. And as a result, now they start bleeding kills, right? This is a top team in the world. And yes, it was the grand finals. And I believe the, the casters were like, yeah, this... Teams kind of panic, right? Because I, I don't think they would have responded if they were playing at full form. But that's what happens. People panic to dives. They don't know what to do. All of a sudden, there's just five heroes running at your tier three. <laughs> and it's very important to consider that Topson's Monkey King, I find, is very good because he's extremely diligent at balancing his farm with fighting, right? He pushes in multiple creep waves. He takes multiple jungle camps. He's top CS in this game, right? And you've seen he's run around a, a decent bit. He hasn't ganked a ton. Right, but he's moving from side lane to side lane and collapsing with his team. And these are the ganks that I think really separate a high player from someone, you know, a little bit lower, where his movements are not predicated on random ideas or random like it doesn't just see your hero like oh I'm going. It's I push in a wave, I force a TP, or I find an advantage where my team can collapse together and then I move. And this is very beneficial for Monkey King because of his ability to get bursted, especially pre-Echo Saber and pre-Tank items as, you know, your escape capabilities, if you get caught, is not so good, especially against a lineup with an Enigma, a Rasta, and a Tidehunter. And something I noticed that's very interesting about OG is a couple ideas, right? Which, let, let's go over it now. So, OG as a whole crushed his TI. How? We look at their numbers, their offlaner has 85 CS at 1730. Their Ember Spirit has 90 at 1730, a hero that potentially flash farms. The Monkey King has 128, which is pretty good, actually quite good. And that's at a high level, that's not that impressive. Like these numbers aren't that impressive. They're just not. 
And it begs the question, then how do they build the 3k lead? And it's obviously through kills, but it's through this immense map pressure that they create instantly. They full commit to their movements, which I think is a big big deal for these teams it often takes quite a bit of time and in pubs it can take two to three minutes for teams to to gather up and and collapse og it's instant if they commit they full commit and that's what i love they are confident that they are going to win every single fight they run at you believing they're going to kill you there's no doubt in their mind they're going to mess up some gang or run into you accidentally if they catch you they catch you if they don't like look at this they see we mid they don't see anyone else Tidehunter is dead, which is, you know, a, a good reason to go, but it's only for three seconds. Instant committal. Instant. No hesitation. And as a result, now they catch Weeha, and now they obviously can catch Kuroki right afterwards, because he's just an immobile Shadow Shaman. And this is what's impressive about this team. Instant collapse, no hesitation. And I believe this is what they're better at than any other team in Dota right now. Their ability to instant commit with no hesitation. It's confidence. Confidence. Right, and I feel like this is the playstyle you sometimes have with your friends when you have a good game. Right, you're like, guys, we're crushing, let's go. We're just diving, we're going. And in those games, sometimes you go too deep <laughs> and you just kill yourself. But in a lot of situations, you actually manage to stomp the enemy team. And that's where I'm going to end up this first segment for Monkey King. And, you know, I know I didn't cover the whole thing, but I think this was the, the main points that I wanted to get through with this replay. So now we're going to be looking at Jerax Tiny. In game three, it is currently 1-1, and this is one of my favorite performances of the tournament. I think this guy is an absolute beast on Tiny. This is one of the highest impact heroes on Dota, potentially, due to the fact that it has one of the hardest level two spikes in the game, as it's very easy to toss people under towers, as long as you have one point in Avalanche and one point in Toss. And let's see how OG makes, or Jerax makes this hero look so good. The first thing I want to point out is that he's laning with an Enchantress. This is one of the best Tiny matchups, because it enables him to roam. Enchantress is a hero that naturally enables Tiny to roam because she does not need a laning partner, right? There are other examples. A high level Tidehunter will not need a laning partner if he's against physical damage carries. Uh, and, and there's other examples as well, but Tiny loves laning with these type of heroes and is particularly good with Edge because he also provides sort of a meat shield in the early levels to guarantee that she won't get zoned out in the only point where she's actually killable, which is sometimes level one. In this lane, not basically never, but sometimes level one. Now going into the lane, let's look at the first thing he actually tries to do. It is block this creep wave. Now this is a very common trend we saw throughout TI. And basically what it does is makes the lanes meet under the tier one tower. And as a result, the lane eventually will push into you rather than staticking under the tier one. However, we see Miracle on the other end doing the same exact thing to prevent this, right? This is how you kind of counter it. And due to Miracle's very solid blocking, he's able to stabilize the lane and prevent it from immediately going under tower. And as a result, Jerax makes this nice toss away play and instantly rotates his attention onto managing to get the lane back, right? His main priority is getting the lane back. And as a result, right, he blocks the lane, doesn't work out, and drags wave. He might have dragged the wave anyway, to be frank. But now let's see the next thing he does. He drags the second wave and it, look at the timer, guys. Blocks the small camp with his body, right? This gives you dual effect. I'm sorry, he uses the creep to do it. But regardless, he, he blocks it, the small camp, and drags the wave at the same exact time, right? That's what I call efficiency, and then finds this minute one batting rune. <laughs> you notice he's looking for things to do at this point, uh, considered going mid, but he really just needs some XP. So at this point, he's just going to try to sap. That's exactly what he does. He just saps some XP. Level two is very important for Tiny, and he has no problem sapping a little bit of XP. Not too much. You notice he leaves for a bit. He really isn't doing anything crazy, which is why I want to express to you four players, it totally is possible to, to you know, get to this level of play it's not easy you have to focus on a bunch of different things but at the same time has he done anything ridiculously impossible or giga high mechanical skill not necessarily but very organized right it's very clean he makes all the plays i think he needs to and now at this point he's level two and has a lot more options now right level two is a big spike for you now the next play he makes that is very cool is he's about to miss the side pole right he's a bit late so what you can do is toss the creep right and this allows him to get a very key side pull off, right? Because the lane was static under Jug's tower, which he doesn't like, right? He wants to constantly try to bring the lane back. That's his goal here, right? And as a result, gets his pull off and he gets him a ton of XP as well, right? And gold. And now, right after that, doesn't do anything crazy. Just goes for the bounty rune. Doesn't get it. So he's like, hey, all right, I'm going to walk mid. It doesn't, like, it's not necessarily predicated off anything. He's just, yeah, I'm just going to walk mid. That's it. 
He waits for Weeha to step up. Weeha steps up very far, and as a result, he punishes. He leads with the avalanche, and then tosses, tosses <laughs> under tower. Really clean body blocks also to keep Weeha in the creep wave, and as a result, they're able to pick up the kill and first blood, which was the beginning. This first blood was the beginning of the onslaught of tops in this game. Next thing he does is instantly run back bottom to get the bounty runes. So super clean, right? Like it's unbelievable how much efficiency these players actually get out of these games sometimes. It feels like he had very little downtime this game besides like the early laning stage. And now he picks up his bottle. And right after that, he's kind of figuring out what he wants to do next. At this point, he, he was looking for Weeha coming to the shrine after Topsum dropped him really low. But Weeha makes a smart play to run up and not down. But yeah, at this point, what is he doing, right? Let's talk about this play. Why is it good for Jerex to be here? A couple reasons. Could kill Weeha very easily with the level six of Topson, but more importantly, he's protecting Topson. He's protecting Topson because Topson wants to siege mid tower with his Q, right, his nether blast, and also this cart, right, dual purpose. Not only that, he was also given uh, an observer ward, I believe by no tail, which he places down behind the tower to give even better vision so that they control that area. That's a really nice ward. And now, even though they scan him out, as you can see here, he has no problem just running in and forcing the issue, right? And as a result, they're able to pick up a nice kill. Next thing he does is just run a Weeha. So the amount of space he's created so far and, and just chaos is insane, right? He completely freed up bottom lane and gave Seb a good start by dragging waves and doing those really clean side pulls and giving him free XP. Then he ganks mid, Gets a bottle, gets bounties, now he's back to mid, kills GH, now was running at Weeha, completely ruining his farming patterns. I mean, Weeha's like doing awful. He has 2k net worth, which is the same as his offlaner, or very close to his offlaner that's got dumpstered. I mean, insane impact. And now you notice he wants to play with who is strong. So he could play with Seb, but that's against a Jug, which isn't too great for Tiny, right? You don't like laning against Jug. And as a result, he's going to run to the lane of the person he thinks he can make plays with. Now, of course, Topson ends up having to TP out, so that's not the case anymore. But regardless, due to the TP out, he can get some XP. In fact, he ends up making this nice toss play onto Topson, using the dust as well, to pick up the kill on Weeha. Now here we see Seb dying. Poor Seb on Enchantress. Actually, no, he's playing Enchantress. He deserves to die. However, what does he do after he sees that, right? It might be unclear, but the main thing you want to do as a four in many situations is if your core leaves a lane, have no problem taking it, guys. Take the lane, and that's exactly what he does, right? He went from like a level two Tony that was giving complete XP to Enchantress to now level five at nine minutes, which is quite good. And then with this regen rune, he's able to TP mid, right? He really wants to play with Topson, which is why he's very quick to you know, leave the area, leave bottom as fast as he can. But he did get the XP, which is what's important. <laughs> and now he's just messing around. Really funny play here. But upcoming here, I want to talk about a quick idea as you see him making plays and, and probably about to die. When you are dying, get your spells out. I see a lot of players hold their spells when they're dying as if it doesn't matter. If you're a Rubik, cast Fade Bolt. If you're a Grimstroke, cast your spells. If you're a Tiny, cast your Avalanche, right? Because it allows them to get this kill. It might seem obvious, but... I I swear in so many games, it's it's so common for me to see people just AFK when they're about to die. Cast your spells. Just get them out. Now, upcoming here, we see a beautifully coordinated play by OG that we're actually going to see throughout the game, which is Chrono into Toss. He gets on top of GH and then throws him into the Chrono. Just a beautiful combo I thought I should show. But really, the main point I want to make this game and that I, I just want to instill into your heads, when you are a tiny, you want to play with who is snowballing. You want to play with the hero that has kill potential, right? If it's a Wraith King who's snowballing, you probably don't want to sit next to him if he's jungling, right? However, you want to play with other kill threat because you don't one-shot people at this point in the game, right? He's not going to he's not gonna solo kill anyone, but he can save people, right? Throws Topson out, gives him some assistance there, is able to back him up, get this really nice avalanche, which leads into a quick double kill, right? Tosses in, and you notice this is how, this is how OG makes a lot of their plays. They group up early and play with who's strong. Look what Anna's doing right now, AFK farming. And that's one of the videos I'm actually gonna make for the website. We're gonna talk about Anna and his performance in this game because I think it's like a key integral part of why OG plays so well, what Anna actually does in his lane and after the lane. This upcoming fight here, I think is what separates the good from the great or the great from the good, whatever you wanna call it. Look at his patience. This is really good game sense and just good game knowledge, but look at the patience of his spells here. He could cast his spells and try to lower the ogre's HP, but he understands, is ogre really a problem here? No, 
right? Is Ogre doing the damage? No, he's not the threat. So he's not going to just combo the Ogre. He knows Miracle has spin. So he's going to waste his spells if he casts them on Miracle, right? So he's very, very patient. Like he's literally casting nothing. He's just standing around. He might be like, what is Jarek's doing? Omega Law? <laughs> but really, it's being patient. And as a result of his patience, he's able to save no tell, right? He saves his Taws and saves no tell. And now that the Jug has committed spin, he can get it off an Avalanche, which actually didn't really hit the Jug, but following it up, he gets a Toss, and that's just really clean Dota. So hopefully you can see the point. I talked about this in the Ana video, where you just don't panic in fights, and that's what I mean by don't panic. Look for the key priority targets. Sometimes a little bit of patience determines a fight. And the last thing I want to mention uh, about this replay in particular before I just look at one more team fight, is he has never been on his side of the river this game. Not once. Right, and this is, you know, of nature uh, of OG being super far ahead, of course. But also, it's just him, you know, not playing on a defensive stance. He hasn't played by Ana. He hasn't wasted any time with Ana. He hasn't wasted time uh, just sitting behind Seb, the Enchantress. There's really no need for him to do that. He's spent 100% of his time making plays on the active sides of the map running in the jungle aggressively who cares if he dies even like, like they're in such advantage that he's not dying but i think he would make the same place even if he died just to make space for anna and create chaos within the enemy team and this my friends is how you create a 12k lead right it's a lot of different factors but he's a big part of it this game creating a 13k lead now by 17 minutes that is absurd and this is going to be the last part of the game we look at um Basically, whenever you're going high ground, you can look for a toss back. He actually messed up there, but toss backs are good. Remember, don't make your team dive. Toss backs are kind of nice because it prevents dive, actually. But uh, you know, don't kill yourself, right? Don't just toss back and instantly die. It, it, it's better to be a bit more patient when going high ground. He just saw a gap there. Now, in this situation, why is Jerex able to go on this Tide Hunter? Now, I know you haven't seen the clip yet, so you don't know what I'm referring to, but he sees this Tide and instantly goes on him. Why? Why? If I was just vouching for patience, why go on the Tide instantly? Because Tide is his high prior target, right? Tide is their team fight. Without Tide, they can't fight. And as a result, he goes on him. If that's an Ogre Magi, who cares if he dies? Tide's gonna fall up with a Ravage, but that's the Tide Hunter. And you notice, no diving high ground, chillin', this is top tier Dota, you don't dive high ground unless you're 100% confident you're an IO Bristleback that is going to make Pilot Eye blow his brains out. And this is going to be where I wrap it up, just showing off his clean, pristine positioning here. The fight breaks out. Does he instantly toss combo anyone? No. In fact, maybe he could have gone on the tide there, he could have argued. But he kind of, he, he waits a bit. He chills a bit. And as a result, they're able to get this huge chrono. He tosses the tide into the chrono as well. Follows it up with a multi-man avalanche. And that is part of the reason why OG is one of the best teams in the world or the best team i'm sorry they're, they're probably the best and last but certainly not least we have anna io yes I, I mean i wanted to make a full video potentially on on this but i'm gonna give that lowdown on how to play carry io i feel like it will get nerfed so i actually hesitated on making this for that exact reason because things might change but i'm gonna give you the lowdown on how core io will most likely work for a long long time for starting items it's very important to consider that you have a at least six tangos, a fairy fire, and then the start with the sage's mask, which he's upgraded into a ring of bacillus with the ring of protection in the side shop. Now he's landing with Abaddon, but against a hard lane, right? They have a lot of kill potential and IO is one of the weakest heroes in Dota, but OG enables it with this Abaddon pick. And that's very important to consider, right? Abaddon is a hero that heals and because he has his Q, he can cast it on the IO, which heals him in return. It's a very strong combo that provides a lot of sustain and gives Io an actual lane because Io usually can't really lane that well. Next thing to talk about is how to disengage as Io. So you notice he's getting gone on here by the boys, right? Liquid's going on him. And instead of running away, he actually runs towards them and the support splits. And this allows him to have an easy way out with tethers. So pretty cool idea, but one of the best ways to actually escape as Io as it can be very hard to disengage with this hero otherwise. Once again, you're going to see the same exact thing. Split, and they're good. 
Now, it's important to consider what you actually take at level 2, because I think a lot of players would consider taking spirits, which isn't terrible. However, you can consider that overcharge is actually a lot of damage. It lasts for 8 seconds and gives you 50 attack speed. It's like having a hand of Midas, basically, and Midas doesn't give you even as much as that. So the attack speed is really insane how much it actually gives you and allows them to pick up that kill. And spirits used to be very good early on because they slowed, but they don't anymore. So overcharge is a good level 2 option. So there's a few things to, important to consider on IO when trying to amplify your farm. And those things are that clarities are extremely important. If you do not buy clarities while farming on IO, you will not get to your axe fast enough and you will not get to level 15 fast enough. And that's the important one because you want to continuously farm endlessly so that you can get to that level 15 mark. That is what's strong for IO. The 75 heroes damage essentially doubles, straight up doubles, your damage right it's literally insane and the second half to this is it's totally okay to jungle early you notice very early on he makes this play where he drags one camp out initiates the spirits and manages to farm two camps at the same time ayu is a hero that doesn't lane very well right you, you, as i've said earlier and as a result this early jungling is a safe option that will guarantee your scaling and i think that's generally important in fact it allows him to actually contribute to this mid kill here don't know if it actually mattered it was a bit close but in general, it gives you a bit of options as you're not just stagnant in a lane, especially if it's a bad lane. And if you understand the basis behind this Helm Tom, uh, basically Tether gives you movement speed and the Helm Tom creeps have very high movement speed. And as a result, Io can move around at 458 movement speed all the time. But yeah, other than that, this hero is brutally simple right now, which is why I expect it to get nerfed. It's really just this farming pattern of drag the camps together, nuke out the wave, and then farm an open lane if it's there. Right? I mean, he even saves no tell here, so you even have that option. Uh, and a side note that we almost missed there is that he buys the tome. They give him the tome. In fact, they give him both this game, which we'll bring up a bit later. But yes, they literally give him the tome. That's how important levels on IO are. And once again, you'll notice the clarities. So pretty cool play here. Buying clarities, giving him the tome, buys the staff for Mr. Tree first, which gives him more int to farm even longer. And in general, you can see his priorities. He has no problem showing up to mid fights, you know, if his team needs him. But right after they they kind of split off, he backs to the to the jungle, right? And even after he sees them go mid, what is his immediate movement, right? Like five heroes mid, instantly goes bottom. This creates pressure on the bottom tower with his wild wing extra armor and simply just gives him lane XP, right? The, the lane creeps are always better than jungle creeps if possible. So just a good efficiency play and a heads up play in general for him. In fact, he continues doing it for the next minute. But literally once a hero TPs in, he's out. And this is the premise of IO. I would love to say it's more complicated than this, but... If you can follow this part farming pattern of sustain the lane with the lane support and then farm these three jungle camps, if you're on Dire, there's also, you know, basically a very similar layout where you can drag camps out. And as a result, you snowball, right? Because you're actually particularly weak pre this Ags in level 15. Not unplayable, you still do a fair amount of damage and you can heal people. It's not, you're not useless, which is why he shows up to the fight, but you're near it. And now I want to talk a little bit more about OG's actually general gameplay and not just focused solely on the Ana Io as he literally does nothing but farm this game and, you know, I guess help on mid from time to time. But that is, if we look at the map and the state of the map, OG does a very nice job of forcing proper objectives. They forced mid earlier with the Timber and the Tiny. There's actually a clip of Moon Meander where he talked about how important it was for Seb to actually siege mid instead of actually farming the camp. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend you look it up. And yeah, they, they just create a lot of space. Like look what Seb's doing right now, shoving lane in front of three heroes. And that's why it's such a good Timber pick this game because he can make plays like that. He can shove the aggressive lanes, not necessarily that he counters all these strength heroes. While that's great, it's great by all means, that's great. But also his ability to create pressure on the map because it is hard for them to kill him and same thing for Thompson look Anna's farming jungle what does Thompson do shoving lanes they are not jungling on these heroes once again Seb top is he jungling guys no if you have a hard carry like a Terrorblade a Spectre I guess an Io in this case Io is literally a hard carry then you have to make space by getting in the lanes right and then you have your your hero that can't necessarily fight that well the trolls the TB the Spectre the PA doing this and that is a really good formula if you're playing with friends to win games, right? Because it is very reliable if you have your strong heroes fighting and your weak hero farming. And this hopefully makes a lot of sense to you. It's sort of a simple concept at, at a base value. It's just sometimes hard to execute it because the whole like spreading out the map is very difficult and, and playing aggressive areas is very difficult. But if you can kind of get that down, 
you notice a huge shift in the general farming patterns of not only you, but also your carry player. It will keep them a lot safer. And then coming up here was a huge play by OG. We noticed just the really quick farming patterns from Anna as we skip ahead. But what ends up happening here is that Liquid is setting up for a top push and Ayo is not in a place to fight yet, right? He's not at his level 15 yet. So what do they do? Similar to giving him the minute 10 book, they also give him the minute 20 book or he buys it for himself, right? Regardless, he takes it. And as a result of having both these books, it's crazy. He's able to delay the push. Like this is next level Dota where obviously I don't think he intentionally or foresaw the 20 minute high ground push from Liquid. Although he might have an inkling that they're going to do it because they have a Chen Bristle plus an Omni Knight. And as a result, him taking both the Tomes exactly perfectly allows him to get this level 15 talent exactly when they're going high ground. That's why OG won TI. I mean, plays don't get much better than this. So hard to explain and, and, and reciprocate things like this. Like, I don't know how you teach this, frankly. This is just crazy good experience, game knowledge, game understanding, and teamwork. When no tail doesn't instant buy the tome and use it on himself. That's a real position five. <laughs> but I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, I had a good time making this one. Uh, great to see OG win once again. I mean, such a nice team to watch. The players just seem very genuine and, and happy and you gotta love it. It's a great story, great people, great Dota all together. It's the full package. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed, please do like and subscribe and consider checking out the Game Leap website where I'll be making more of these exact same videos and plus one over there. Bye-bye.